And with that, I'm going to introduce Sibin, uh, who leads one of the activities within CREDSI, uh, one of four, I believe, that uh, have some aspect of software-defined networking. And uh, he's going to introduce the speaker. So doing this is hierarchy of fashion. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, this talk is going to be given by uh, Rakesh Kumar, who's a PhD student in ECE. Um, I primarily works with David Nickel, but he has been collaborating with me and my group on this particular topic of using SDN in safety critical and real-time embedded systems. Um, so this paper uh, has been accepted for publication uh, in for December, and this is in collaboration with some folks at Oregon State and uh, Smriti, who is now at MIT, she used to be here. So without much ado, Rakesh. All right. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank so, so the basic question that this um, talk is going to try and answer is, can you, what, is the, what does the picture look like for QoS in a um, real-time system? And can you do anything better than what has been done before or what opportunities it provides? And it, it, this project has, we've been working on it for a year and a half and it's just taking some time. Um, so <laughs> let's get into it. So the motivation is that there are a lot of critical applications that require timing guarantees and they have at the same time a specific bandwidth requirement. So, you know, examples include smart grids, of course, uh, avionics, automobiles, you know, automobiles. Um, and the current approach, you know, there's schemes that uh, try to do this. What they do is they separate out the network, they heavily over-provision the network to make sure the guarantees are met, uh, which ends up, you know, resulting in uh, either higher cost management and cost overheads, or you have an increased attack surface, now you're having to manage more than one network, and uh, that's not good. So that's, that's, that's what the motivation for this work is. Uh, this is a canonical diagram for software-defined networks that have been used a lot. So you I have, have a question sure. before you go to sure. the FDS, yeah. because I would like to hear your argument. Sure. Why not MPLS? Why not use MPLS? Uh, so MPLS also suffers from the same kind of issues from manage, for management of things. It has, you know, people have, it, it's a, I mean, now the industry kind of has a better grasp, but it's been around for a while. It took for a while to be standardized. Um, sure, it can be done using MPLS, by all means. Uh, I think if you, if you had a, a good network engineer who knows the protocols inside out and does a distributed control plane, by all means, you can, you can do it with that. Well, One other thing that I miss uh, in any of these approaches, and uh, I'm wondering what your feeling about it, is that uh, MPLS is embedded in the layer two of the network protocol. Uh -huh. And applications have very hard time to get access to uh, the MPLS uh, quality of service classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, it's great for the ISPs mm -hmm. to that because the internet protocol is the application to the MPLS. But anything else, uh, if we do smart grid or something application, mm -hmm. uh, you go to TCP, UDP, there is just no pipeline to actually specify those. Right, and, and that's, yeah, so the, the, the main thing that this, you know, that the FDN provides is it provides you a centralized view of the state. And then control plan. And the control plan, of course, along with that. So, uh, yeah, so with MPLS, we'll be stuck with the distributed control plan, and it'll be, it'll be harder to read and manage. That's, that's the big reason why you do it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have, this is a network. You have an SDN controller. Each switch has a link to the a control link to the uh, controller. You have hosts at the switches, and you usually have a not found API which the controller exposes. So all the current controllers have a version of this, and you have your application sitting on top of that, which is consuming that API. Sometimes this application sits within the controller. Sometimes it's outside, doing more like a REST API kind of structure where the state is completely their states are completely separately stored. Um, but the idea is the entire network state, what links there are, the topology, 
how much of that quality is being used, what hosts are connected, where they are connected, all of that is available. So you can do some centralized, you can use some centralized mechanism to do some sketching. Uh, so, and the other key feature here is that what, what SDN has driven towards is they have simplified switch logic. So the logic that exists on the switches now is extremely simple, and the result of that is now these things have been commoditized. So you, you buy them in bulk and they're very cheap, which is the other reason why this, the, talk, the motivation for this talk uh, is also that you want to be able to provide guarantees, but not have them cost too much. Uh, so since the systems are very simple and the logic is entirely in the controller, you know, you can do that. All you have to do is, all you have is some very simple mechanisms that you control from them. And switches have not a whole lot of uh, features on them, which is like that. And that, that makes them uh, cheap to procure. Uh, so this is an experiment which we did before we, uh, before we did anything else, which was we just, you know, put together two switches. Um, these are software switches, by the way. This is a middle metropolitan. And so these SDN switches, they, you can, you can specify, if, if there's a port, you can specify different queues on the port and you can assign bandwidth to those. You can assign bandwidth to the, those queues. Uh, so this was the topology. There was a physical link between the two switches and we have two hosts on each end. And the flow, this was the path of the flow. And if you notice, these two flows share this port here. And what we did was, in one case, we, we, made the, we made both of the flows go through the same queue. And in the other case, we made them go through their separate queue. So the flows, they were sending traffic at 50 Mbps. When they were separate queues, each queue was configured to have 50 Mbps allocated on them. When they were sent on the same queue, the queue had 100 MBPS. So we, we didn't shortchange any flow in how much capacity was available in the queue. We just made them go through the same queue. Just to see what happens when flows belonging in different applications interfere. And these flows are very simple, constant bitrate. They are not TCP, they are UDP. They don't back off or anything like that. If they saturate the link, you, you start seeing some drops, but we didn't see any drop. We didn't saturate them that fast. So what we did, the send rate is x axis. Uh, and by this is mean delay, and on this plot it's the 99th percentile of the delay. And what you see is, so when your queues are different, you see that you know the, the delay is strictly less when the queues are same. If, the, if both those are made to go through the same queue, they start interfering, the experience hardening, and there's a gap. The second thing you notice is, especially in the 99th percentile. You start seeing a lot more variations as you get closer to uh, to the capacity, to the full capacity of the link that is available, to the queue, to the queue that is available. And these are not, these are not novel results. These, these are standard queue theoretical results. The delay starts increasing as you approach the capacity. Lens up. As long as lambda is less than new, things will be fine and stable. So this plot doesn't show the x-axis going far back. So at 45, you see very stable. We did 50 iterations of each of each of these. Very stable delay, but it starts increasing up. But it doesn't just increase; it also becomes unpredictable. And when it becomes un unpredictable, that's a, that's when you know really bad things happen. So there are two major takeaways from this this experiment that we got. One is when you're going to be if you're going to use queues to isolate flows in SCN, you have to over provision somehow. You can't set it exactly to the rate that application is going to set. This is a very empirical practical observation. Um, the second was that it is worth it to put them in separate queues. It is by all means worth it. Like, there is a lot of schemes that have been suggested over the years that do statistical multiplexing. But what we did was we said, okay, let's just do this so that we put them, everyone gets their own queue at every point. It's a very, very conservative uh, way to go about doing this, but we said, let's do it. And um, because the, the motivation is real-time applications, and we didn't want to, you know, break the gap. Um, what was the scheduling algorithm between the queues? So the queues, they were using a version of weighted character. This, this is embedded in Linux kernel stack. 
Yeah. Uh, so the question was, can you be an architecture? I think I've already answered this question in a way. Uh, can, can you actually compute flow paths? Yes, because you have all the state of it. Uh, and can you actually use SDN architecture to allocate resources? Yes, because you can allocate queues and hence and allocate bandwidth on the queues. And, and those are the two resources that you have. Um, so, so far, the setup is okay. This is, so, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be scheduling queues. That's, that's the game we're playing. Um, um, and so, what I'll be talking about the rest of the talk is we'll talk about what happens to a packet within a switch, to describe the problem, talk about the system model. We frame it as a multi-constrained uh, path problem. Good thing that Clara is here because you know use her work, uh, previous work as a baseline, and we, with the prop, we just mapped the problem to that. Uh, we'll evaluate it in, in a simulation setting and in an emulated setting, and we'll conclude and describe the work that we are currently doing. Okay. So what happens to a packet when it? So this is a, so this is a simple dumb SCM switch, right? What does it have? It has a port. It has a bunch of, not a single port, multiple ports. It has queues assigned to them. And you can assign different capacities to the queue. I've already covered it. It has flow tables, which have forwarding rules in them. Okay, so each, each flow rule has a match and election part. So you can identify a five couple and assign it one or more actions. And it has a meter table through which you can rate limit the flow. So you can say if, if a traffic matches the flow, meter it at this rate. And you can use that metering table at the ingress, or, or I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, for the rest of this talk, I'll be talking more about the queues and assignment of resources to the queues themselves. So we, I won't be touching meters until we hit future work at the end. Um, so there's only a single meter table. That is one of the reasons why we don't do that. Uh, because that means there's very few meters available on the uh, on the switch, but there's a lot of uh, queue, well, a lot of ports available, and hence queues. So typically in hardware switches, you see eight up to eight queues per port. And what we're saying, the argument here is that yes, you would be limited by the number of queues, but you should just have, add a lot more links because you you have a 48 port switch, you should just use multiple links between those two switches. That's the kind of the argument that you're making here, because we have this quantity available in a, large, in a larger amount. Um, okay, so packet comes in, matches on a flow rule, gets sent to a queue or gets metered, and you know the queues exist on the output, and you have something like a scheduling algorithm, like I was just describing, we did get queuing running here, packet gets out. That's what happens in the switch. But what happens on network level? Let's look at a Topology where there are three switches, you have a scatter controller here, and there's an Ethernet relay here, and there's a flow which is very critical, and it has a deadline, and it is sending packets, right? So what we are saying is each flow FK has a bandwidth and the delay requirement. The bandwidth, both of them are upper bound. The flow may not be using all the requirements <coughs> both in both, but the delay is basically, yeah, you, it's, that's the worst case it can solve it. So the each flow, we have those two numbers available as part before we do anything. For each application, we're assuming that these two numbers are given. Now, this particular delay is a end-to-end -end delay, or do you break it down what currently the delay at the switch? This is an end-to-end -end delay requirement of the flow. So the flow says, I need to get this packet from this switch to this switch in 100 microseconds, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's an upper bound. Because you know, some of the approaches would take, here's the end to end delay. If I currently know how many intermediate uh, hops are there, they divide the end to end delay by this particular number of switches and then basically derive, that was actually the Ferrari approach to have these intermittent delays uh, so that basically the switch knows what's my delay to get that particular packet out. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. 
Yeah. This just comes from the, the, the real time systems requirement saying that for an application, I give you the increment delay, but I don't care how it goes through the system. I just need to make sure it's there. Yeah. And the problem is really you're given n such flows, and you have to schedule them through your topology so that both of their requirements are satisfied. If you cannot schedule all such flows, you walk away. You say, I, can, I, I cannot do it. That's your engine control session. If you can, you do that. And then you walk away. Then the controller is out of the picture. You, you synthesize those flows and the switches, and then you walk away. So there's no, no communication going on between switches or so the controller is not in the data side. The controller is gone, up, gone out of the picture. Um, so how do we do this? We set up one flow at a time, right? Then we set up a flow, some resources are used, right? And we update those resources. Uh, and when and then we use I'll be describing how we compute this path, but we compute a flow path through the network so that the requ its requirement, that one flow's requirement, are met, and we realize it. Right? And I'll talk, I'll, I'll go through how both of those steps are done. So far, so good. Everything's clear. Okay. So what is the model here? Um, we have a graph. But the nodes of this graph are ports in the network. They're not switches. So what we are basically saying is you are going from port to port to port to port. Now, the edges, they are either coming from the physical topology, they are physical links, or they are, if the two ports are on the same, same switch, they are based, we are assuming they are connected, but the cost is the cost of processing, switching. And, it, you know, in the paper that we wrote about it, we go through how you could estimate the cost like that. And it turns out to be order of 10 microseconds for software switches that we have, that, that we were using. Um, 5 to 10 microseconds is very good. So that's, that's the model. Uh, so you're sending packets from one port in the network to another port in the network, and you have queues available at each port. Okay, so how do you, what is the total delay of a given path? Well, it is the delay it experiences on each individual edge, right? You just sum them up. What is the total bandwidth consumed by each flow in the entire path? Well, again, what we are saying here is consume some bandwidth on some edge, you just sum it up and you and you come up with this quantity. It is not exactly the bandwidth of the flow, but it is essentially the amount of space or the weight that flow is occupying across all of them. So it's not bandwidth, but it's basically being multiplied by the number of links that are there. Yeah, because the end bandwidth actually is a mean metric. Yeah, yeah. It's not an additive. Yeah, but this, this will make sense when we put it in the in the solver. When we map it, we map it. Like no, so as games don't reason about delays, they reason about bandwidth today, right? And that's part of so to have to we have to map it that way as well. Okay, so these are the two quantities that uh, are associated with each flow k. And pk is here is the path of the flow. I should have said that before. Um, so this, what we do is we formulate this as a multi-constraint path. So you have two constraints. You have a length constraint and you have a weight constraint. So the weight constraint, this is the total delay that this is the budget. All we're saying is that the delay that is experienced by the packets is less than or equal to that. That is one constraint. The bandwidth constraint is that it just needs to be, the, the entire uh, space that on the links that this flow is going to occupy should be less than the maximum bandwidth available on any edge times the number of nodes. So we are multiplying that. We are coming up with a big quantity. And we are just saying, as long as you are under this, you'll be fine. Now, this is actually a pretty wide, there's a pretty wide gap between these quantities. And what this results in, and uh, we can talk about when we evaluate this, 
it becomes clear that there's a sharp drop off because of the way we are using this constraint. But, you know, it is still a rubber bound. That's, that's all we're saying. Now, if you solve multi constraint path problem, it is NP complete. So, but there are polynomial time heuristics available. One of them uh, we used, it was Clara's uh, prior work. Uh, so, we ma map this problem onto that. And the heuristic, it works basically, it relaxes one constraint at a time. It first relaxes the delay constraint, sees this, uh, so it's, it's kind of like bin packing. You relax one constraint, you see, and you see now, can I, can I fit this flow onto the network? If, and then you relax the other constraint, and you go like that, and you either fit it eventually or you can not um, Okay, so basically what, what this output of this path, at the output of this, after you run this algorithm, what you get is a path, right? And you know what bandwidth to assign to at each link in the, in the network, what bandwidth to assign to that. Now the question is, how do you realize it, right? So it, basically what we do is we take the entire path, we decompose it into, into a bunch of intents. And intent is basically what happens at an individual switch. And it's a sort of book. It is a match which matches on, which identifies the flow. It has the input port, output port, and the rate. This rate gets tagged onto the queue. So we, what we do is we, for each intent, we put a flow room on the switch, we put a queue on the switch, we assign the rate to the queue, and we refer that queue into the output port. That, that's, that's basically how, so if you have a flow like this, you know, this is a, it's good. You know, you have one intended switch, one, switch two, switch three, and uh, that's it. That's basically it. And you're done. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. On, the, on the path discovery, those are all pre-computed based on um, design constraints, or are they recomputed dynamically based on load effectively? They are recomputed based on topology and the requirement. Okay. Yeah, you're not, there's nothing dynamic. All we are saying is you, somebody has you a bunch of requirements under topology, you schedule your flows and you work on If something fails, then you need to do that from scratch. Yeah. So are you, are you assuming that you know upfront how many different blocks you would have in any yes. given moment in this entire network? Yes. And and uh, how do you know this? Well, there's there's an even deeper level than that. So it's not just the flows, but you need um, the specifics of the behaviors and peculiarities of each of those flows. Right. So you need bandwidth for each one, right? Yeah. Because so, yeah. So. That's a very good question. So the, the way we are saying is that, the, okay, here's the reason that we are just defining it. The type of networks where these type of things are deployed, they're small networks, people usually know at design time what traffic is going to flow. In power grid especially, this happens all the time. People know what flows are going to be going, uh, what flows are going to be existing in the network. If they know what the requirements are, they probably know what the flows are going to be. And what we do is, I'll talk about this later, but what you can also do is you can leave some queues empty on your flow, some spare capacity, and say, this is my everything. So if you, if you have a pain packet, if you have a pain flow, you don't have to allocate all this for that. <coughs> that flow still goes through. But all the critical flows, we are, we are saying you know them if you're, that's, that's it. Not all flows, but all the critical flows that you care about you know that. You have another question? No. Yeah. You have another question? Oh, no. 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 Uh, so not to go down this tangent, but um, maybe you're going to get to this. Are you only considering things at a flow level, or do you have granularity to look at different requirements internal to a flow? So for instance, um, control commands via specific protocol versus data commands. No. The two things that we know about the flow are how much bandwidth does it need? What is it? What what is it delivered? Okay. okay. Yeah. So 
So then we evaluated. So we did two evaluations. Uh, one is kind of like a simulation. Uh, the other is we we run it inside a minute every day. So we what we so these are the parameters. We have five switches, and each link is each link between the switches has 10 MBPS bandwidth on it. We add flows to it, different number. I'll be describing how many uh, flows to it. And we just pick a random number between one to five for flows. This, these are the controllers we use. This is RIO controller we use, you know, open, open flows. So all of this is done in software switches. Um, and what we do is we, the topology here is we construct a ring out of the five switches. And then we add additional links. So we generate random topologies by modifying that ring, trying to convert it into a click. Uh, but we don't go all the way. I think we, we don't go all the way to the click. We just add one less link than what it would uh, make what would make it a click. Okay. So first question is how many flows can you pack in a topology? Right. What does the algorithm do? How 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 does how does it um, how does it perform? So your link delays are picked randomly between 25 to 125 microseconds. This is what we pick. For each flow dk is delay requirement. It, we make it a function of random of the topology that is generated. Uh, we pick a d min, which is Minimum, so D min being associated with the flow which has the most stringent requirement. It is a flow that needs to get to its destination fastest. And we pick different numbers for that, from 200 to 1,000 microseconds. And we increment it by D min by 10 for subsequent flow, so that there is a, there is a natural priority uh, for this flow. So for each choice of daemon and number of required flows, we generate 250 topology, random topology, then we try to schedule all the flows. The, we vary the number of required flows. I'll show you a plot. Um, and we compute this number called acceptance ratio, which is how many topologies of the 250 was the algorithm able to schedule all the flows. So if it was able to schedule all the flows, which means it's great. If it was not, then the number drops. Um, so this is the plot. This is the requirement, the delay requirement of of the flow. These are the number of flows that were there that we required to be uh, scheduled. This is the acceptance ratio. So when your delay requirement is relaxed, or you have you know small number of flows that you're scheduling, things are fine. You can schedule all of them. But as soon as you start tightening any one of those things, you have a sharp problem. You cannot schedule uh, many flows anymore. To the point where you hit zero, if you make them all close to 200 and, you know, <clears throat> I think four or five. So this is a result of being extremely conservative. The sharp drop-off drop -off is also a result of being extremely conservative. Uh, and yeah, this this scheme needs improvement. We we have to play with knobs of the algorithm to find where the optimal is, and you know how to make it so that we are closing, reaching close to the optimal. Um, can the flows be realized? Can you actually run these flows once you have determined what path they are going to take, and? You know, what happens when you do this on a software switch? That's the question we are trying to ask in this simulation. So what you do is you set the link delay to zero. You say, let's just say, you know, let's just see what happens. Are there any queuing artifacts that we see running? Right? And you have 25 different topologies in this case. Total, you add one to three non-critical background flows, which have same requirement, same kind of requirements as the critical background, <coughs> and you have seven critical. You just fix that number. Right? You use the algorithm, and then you send constant bit rate traffic using networks. And 
would you, would you, would you, the way you pick the link is you t take a look at the diameter of the topology and you multiply 100 microseconds. So if it's a topology where the diameter is large, you'll, you know, you'll have more, uh, more room when you're scheduling it. Um, so what happens now? So remember, there's no link delays. Still, you see a large amount of variation. Um, so where's this variation? Well, let's just go through it. So the main delay is, you know, you get about five microseconds. This is being done on a single machine running well net inside, you know, a VM. Um, the CDF of the 99 percentile delay, you know, this is essentially telling you that there's some kind of system artifacts that are happening. This is not hardware. So if you're, if you're going to try and do this on software, the processing that the software is going to provide you is going to vary because all kinds of things are going on on the OS which you cannot control. So we weren't running anything else on this VM. It was just this, but even then we got this kind of variation. And this is the worst case. So we, there will inevitably be one or two packets when we are running network which will experience a lot of delay in a given case. And we're just reporting that here. Um, and again, I, we think this is because of the US scheduling artifact. Um, so we, we need to do this experiment in the hardware. That's the conclusion of the slide, it's kind of work in progress. But even what this is telling you is, even hardware switches sometimes have some variations in how they process packets. They, they don't, some, because now what's happening is a lot of hardware switches are using OBS as part of their data path elements of OBS and part of the data path. So this is an aspect of this, this raw processing of packets is a number which, which starts start to figure into what, what kind of performance you see. Um, the next thing we did was we varied the number of clues. And this plot, this only, we're only plotting 99 percentile delay here. And now, so you have three, you have three background flows, and you have two, three, four, five critical <coughs> flows. And what happens is, when you increase the number of flows, again, your, you know, interquartile range increases. The delay that is being increased by these flows again is, you know, the variance on, on that increases. And this is again another result of, you know, doing this on software Um are there any questions? Right. Right. So that's, those are the two evaluations we've done so far. Um, so what are the conclusions? Uh, we have used commodity hardware to successfully schedule flows onto SD. Um, are there any questions? Anna, did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I have various questions. So one is, uh, I think it was sort of uh, uh, asked before, scalability, right? So the SDN controller needs to have all of these information. So I, I, I suppose you are assuming that there are fairly stable sort of telemetry type of flows uh, so that you can uh, scale these up uh, because, um, or maybe you are thinking more of a, a, a smaller perimeter uh, where the SDN controller, perhaps a substation or uh, a control room where the SDN controller will work. So that's one question. Um, then the other the other question is uh, vulnerability. So uh, of course SDN is mentioned in many places as a as a in, in other projects as well as uh, possible enforcers of uh, security rules. Uh, but the, the fact that the SDN is centralized, uh, it's like a single point of failure. In other words, um, uh, it doesn't have the properties of the ARPANET uh, in that sense. Um, of being uh, decentralized and therefore fairly resilient. Uh, so I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. 
Mm. And finally, uh, sort of a last comment in terms of uh, uh, evaluation, have you seen the impact on, for instance, <coughs> uh, so just putting your uh, um, a, a classic control loop and seeing what is the effect of optimizing the flows to SDN rather than using packet switching. Uh, so these are my questions. Um, so let me go through them one by one. So the, the classic that we are using here, yes, in this case, <coughs> for the example, we're using constant bit rate UDP traffic. But as long as the application, as long as the information about the bandwidth requirement and delay is provided correctly, the application could be anything. Yeah, because I understand. Yeah. I understand. So, I'm just saying that in terms of evaluation, it would be nice to see the impact it will have on a, an actual control loop. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, research on using uh, understanding the limits of feedback control with packet switching, just regular packet switching with drops of packets and delays. Uh, it would be nice to see that with the SDN instead you actually have better performance. Um, so it's, it's just sort of a more of a suggestion, uh, right? We'll connect uh, more clearly the benefits uh, in industrial control of SDN. Um, Hi, uh, this is Bor Akio from PNNL. Um, good presentation, thank you. I'm going to echo what Anna said earlier. Um, so I've been working on this field since the 1990s. I was one of the authors of the one of the MPLS IFCs as well as the contributor to the IFCP TE draft. Um, nothing that you have talked about here is is not discussed ad nauseum in IETF archives in the early to mid 1990s, uh, concluding with how we ended up with MPLS TE uh, and RSVP, MPLS with RSVP TE for traffic engineering. So, I mean, they, they, I understand the draw of SDN and having centralized and global visibility into the network that you're seeing. But fundamentally speaking, there are very good reasons why, and time-tested reasons, as to why things have evolved in the networking world as, as they have. So my question is, if you were running a network with multiple, uh, let's say many wavelengths, like the energy sciences network that, that exists for DOE national labs and academic institutions, how would you scale this up where you have millions of flows and fundamentally you have, you know, uh, links on the order of N where N is a very large number? And how you maintain reliability and availability without having massive uh, replication problems for the distributed database? Um, so the question, um, as I understand, is how, how does the scheme scale up? So as long as you have a single controller, um, I think this is scaled to. We haven't actually done uh, scalability tests on the, but I think the the polynomial time heuristic will scale to a degree. It won't. It's not exponential time. It won't take you all the way, but it'll scale to a degree, right? Can the I, second thing, sorry, uh, Rakesh. Uh, this is yes. this is the other Rakesh from OSU. Um, can I can I take a shot at answering um, Bora's question? Sure. Uh, so Bora, I think uh, sorry to interrupt Rakesh because I thought you were, you were going a different direction. I wanted to clarify this. Um, this is not meant to run a wide area network, open network like the one you're talking about, this is meant to run a control network, um, you know, either at the substation level or maybe even from a control center to a substation level, uh, very specific to um, control operations. This, I mean, obviously this cannot, um, the way the scheme is right now, this won't scale at the internet level. And that's the reason, you know, these things didn't get adopted for internet architecture, because, you know, that's completely different set of assumptions than we have in the situation. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, that was my question. Like, do, are you thinking of a control uh, scenario? It's a limited perimeter for very fast controls. 
binary control. So. Right. So, in, in, Rakesh, by the way, it's been a while, so good to hear from you again. Uh, uh, what I was going to say is, in that case, you know, on a typical Ethernet switch today, I can get, you know, 480 gigabits to a terabit throughput. Um, how much overhead are we adding with, with trying to scale these things versus kind of the land uh, philosophy of let's get a lot of bandwidth and then uh, we'll, we won't worry about the quality of service later. So if I may interject, I do sit in, um, so if you look at the kinds of applications we're talking about, let me look like, for instance, point to say avionics or automotive. These systems don't uh, have, uh, you know, uh, custom built solutions or things that use, uh, you know, a huge amount of engineering, things like AFPX and CAN, I'm uh, sure they're widely available, but they're not cost competent. They're not easy to, you know, put together. They're expensive to manage and maintain. And there's a reason why they do that, because they need this high amount of, and it's not about bandwidth, it's what Rakesh pointed earlier, is predictability. What you want is predictability for those end-to-end -end delays. Sure, I can put a really fast switch in there, and most of the time it might work. But in a particular case, when a certain combination of traffic happens, suddenly things go off. And this is coming from the hard real-time systems community, right? These kinds of requirements. It, the similar requirements exist for the processing as well. So there's any amount of engineering required. So every single router around the switch has to be carefully managed by an engineer and the traffic that goes through it. Similarly, for high critical traffic, there are one set of networks. Then the medium criticality traffic, there are other completely different networks. And finally, for low-end traffic, there are third networks. So again, there's huge amounts of management overhead. So, and, and it's for a contained system. It's not meant for internet traffic. So these are the kinds of constraints that exist when you're looking at this problem. And I the same thing like, something like AFDX and CAN and all of those other redundant networks and try to see if SDN might be useful in management because it has this centralized view of it. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, though I would, I would suggest you make a comparison of two control schemes and just look at the difference they will make to have the SDN versus uh, utilizing uh, packet switching at, at different rates, right? Because eventually, uh, as Bora was saying, you know, if you just totally over-design the network in terms of uh, bandwidth available, you will uh, get a similar behavior. But obviously, uh, in the SDS solution, you will maintain it um, even a much uh, with, with a, a less powerful network. Um, so I, I think it will be interesting to just sort of showcase the difference that it will make. Sure. That's a great uh, point, um, Anna. This is Rakesh. And, and Bora, yeah, it's been, it's been a while, but I think uh, what you pointed out is true. I mean, we are, we are coming up with these fast switches, and then we are kind of being very conservative with the bandwidth. I mean, this is how today, from my understanding, without SDN, uh, the end-to-end -end delays are guaranteed. I, I still get uh, talk to vendors who prefer want to sell serial boxes because they have much better control on the timing. Uh, but you know the industry and everybody is moving away. So they, as Sibin pointed out, they want predictability. Um, they they're not worried about um, using up a lot more bandwidth to do this. So we are we are seeing, uh, as Anna pointed out, can we do this without you know. Today, they all provision it. They buy very fast switches and, and you know, hope that uh, put very few clothes on it and hope there won't be delays. We are trying to see if we can change that by by managing um, these um, allocations through the SDN process. And it's we have to test it with a control loop, as Anna suggested, to see what impact it has and how much impact it has. And the second question is, the way it stands today, the it's, it's useful, the scheme, but we are using one um, flow per queue that may be not as scalable as well. Um, so we have to try if we can multiplex. Yep. I have uh, uh, one comment uh, uh, on your metrics. Okay. Um, you um, uh, talk about delay, and that's fine. Um, uh, but um, I'm uh, to some degree cautioning uh, regarding the, the, the memory that you are allocating. I don't even call it bandwidth because it's confusing. Bandwidth for me is bits per second, right? Yeah. And you are talking about bytes or, or bits. Um, 
if you take that kind of sort of memory mm -hmm. and each switch that this particular traffic is taking, mm -hmm. um, I feel that one has to be careful uh, in terms of uh, how you allocate the bits at individual switches because, for example, if you allocate on one switch 100 bits and on the other one for that for 20 bits, <clears throat> right, the resulting end-to-end -end is minimal, right, right. right? So I was just wondering, uh, are you taking that condition yes. Yes. that you are not having flood and then basically the, the other switch is not having the memory to actually take that yeah. So to so use it on the memory, at each link it will definitely get, you know, the bandwidth that was required by the Right, but, but it has to be uh, sort of that if uh, one switch has 20 megabits, the other one has 20 megabits, because otherwise you introduce imbalance of a producer-consumer right. problem, and then we start to drop a uh, packet. No, no, it, it, is, it is consistent across. Okay. Yeah. Also, I yeah. think we know ahead of time what are the, yeah. uh, what are the budgets available at each switch. So when we, when we realize these things, we put the same bandwidth which was required. So the scheduling problem, that memory thing that we're talking about, the, the amount of space that flows, that, 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 right? yeah, that, 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 that is used for how to schedule that. But once you have scheduled it, you don't realize bandwidth based on it. You realize based on the bandwidth that was actually required. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, because, you know, as there used to be, ATM network, yes. uh, talking about Alzheimer's, I don't really want to <laughs> speak to that, yeah. but uh, you know, ATM network, uh -huh. uh, particularly uh, work of Professor Kuhn from Harvard, yeah. is very interesting. Uh, he had back pressure yeah. uh, algorithms, right? That basically, if you start to sort of push uh -huh. too many bits on certain quality of service classes, then basically back pressure sort of set up. Uh, to the center and to each switch basically push back, right? So it doesn't have to drop the packet. So I wasn't quite sure as you run the optimization algorithms at your end switch to do the resource allocation, the that bandwidth allocation, and therefore metering on each particular switch is uh, assigned right. so that you don't sort of have this kind of back pressure. Yeah, so we, in the, the evaluation that I was talking about, we didn't use any meter. So we wouldn't even throttling things at the input. Although a lot of applications would, you know, you might want to do that. That might be a good idea. And as soon as the flow enters your network, maybe it says it needs 100 Mbps, but it's actually starting to use 110. So you want to meter it down to 100. Uh, but that's one way. The other way one could use meters is exactly what uh, I think Sibin mentioned was, or Rakesh, I think, was talking about it. So if, you, if you have one, Queue. Maybe you want to meter two flows and use that same queue for two flows. So you assign this uh, this rate to the meter and then put it in the same queue. Uh, but we need to see how that performs. That's kind of an target idea. Yes. That may be in some of the negative question, but could you articulate for me that you presented what you can do, you assume that you have as the NV switches, right? As the yes. example. Yes. If I say I have regular switches, right? What would be the what is the thing which I couldn't do, which you can do, right. or you are unable to do because of SDN? <laughs> if you take applications such as you know in the context of the power grid. Right. Yeah. So what you cannot do today uh, is to have a state of the network uh, in terms of how much resources are being currently used at each link. Because these, these applications, the topology might evolve, right? Sometimes you don't even have the whole map of the topology. But even if you do have that, even if you go through all the details, you gather all the information. What SDN does is it simplifies, you know, availability of the state so you can run this optimization algorithm on. Sure, but in your approach, right? Mm -hmm. As you said, things so the topology may evolve all the time. I agree on this, mm -hmm. right? But and then the end allows you to capture this and all this, right? But yes. you are not, in your evaluation, you are not taking this into account. You're assuming that the flows are set, mm -hmm. everything is, if there's no time needed for redefining the flows so, or refreshing right. the flows so, yeah. or whatever, yeah. right? So we are not taking this into yeah. account at all. Yeah. Assuming that, that there's no difference, right, between um, this and what you would get if you run in the same way regular switches. Um, I I think you still wouldn't have all that state available in regular switches. 
But you, but what do you need in your evaluation uh, more than what you get from the regular switch? You won't be able to run the optimization problem, for example, if you're doing this in regular switch. You won't have all the state available in one place, right? So the reason you can you can read the state and put your actions into the network is because you have a team. There's a layer which allows you to report your actions into the switches and read the state back. Even if you do this only once for a given instance of the quality until it changes, even if you do this only once, you can't do that with regular switches. They, they come with a spec. Right now. Because what I understood, you have, you know all the flows, you know what is the bandwidth on each link, you know what is the delay on each link, and you calculate. You know all the flows that you have to provide, you know the bandwidth of each flow, and you know the delay that you require. But other things you don't know, right? What the network currently looks like, you don't know. Or what, how much bandwidth in the current network is being used, you don't know. But how the network? I simply, what you just said, I have to send agree with you. Yeah. But you don't know this. Yeah. But I'm asking whether in an evaluation which you did, yeah. you take this into account, this knowledge, or take advantage of the fact that you yeah. able to run the, we are only able to schedule these flows because we have that knowledge. Yes. Okay. All right. We are only able to schedule these flows. So this, you know, these 250 topologies for, for, for data point. We only, we're basically doing is we're gathering that state and when you're running an algorithm, it's fine to, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're gonna close it out. Um, thank the speaker, and if you have further questions,